Hello, and thank you for joining MapleSoft's Virtual User Summit. My name is Shola Slau, Technical Communications Specialist at MapleSoft, and I'm your host for this presentation. The presenters for this session are available in the Communication Lounge from 11.30 to 12 p.m. for a live chat on the day of the event. Please head to the Communication Lounge and select the appropriate scheduled chat for this presentation to ask your questions. If you're viewing a recording at another time and have questions, please leave them on the message board available in the Communication Lounge, and a MapleSoft representative will get back to you. This session is titled, Transforming University Math Courses. There are many ways to bring MapleSoft technology to university math courses, from adding new energy to traditional lectures, to fundamentally transforming the curriculum to reflect a new pedagogy. Two eminent educators discuss how MapleSoft technology transforms the classroom and the benefits this transformation brings to students. Let me now introduce our presenters. Dr. Robert J. Lopez, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at the Robes Hulman Institute of Technology in Terre Haute, Indiana, USA, is an award-winning educator in mathematics and is the author of several books, including Advanced Engineering Mathematics, published by Addison Wesley. For over two decades, Dr. Lopez has also been a visionary figure in the introduction of MapleSoft technology into undergraduate education. Dr. Lopez earned his PhD in mathematics from Purdue University, his MS from the University of Missouri Rolla, and his BA from Marist College. Jack Weiner is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Guelph in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. He has over 30 years of experience in teaching mathematics. He has won both the University of Guelph's Professorial Teaching Award and the prestigious Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations Teaching Award. In an annual Canada-wide university survey conducted by Maclean's Magazine, he has been listed as a popular professor eight years out of nine. Jack has been using Maple for teaching, writing, and recreation for over 10 years. Hello, this is Dr. Robert Lopez speaking. I'm going to talk to you today about clickable calculus. What is it and why? So shortly after arriving at the Rose Holman Institute of Technology in 1985, I discovered that there was a copy of Maxima on the Institute's VAX computer was not my first encounter with Maxima. I had used it 12 years earlier while uh, spending a summer at NASA Langley in Hampton, Virginia. The second time I was using uh, Maxima, uh, it had a really profound effect on my thinking uh, about what its impact on the classroom would be. And at the same time this was happening, there are a lot of other forces at work in the mathematical community. It was a dawn of an age, actually. If you re remember, uh, there was the NSF meeting for calculus reform, and it ended up in the publication Lean, uh, Toward a Lean and Lively Calculus, followed later by the Calculus for a New Century, Pump Out of Filter. At the same time, I made the acquaintance of three researchers, Jeanette Palmiter, uh, Kathleen Hyde, and Phoebe Judson. Jeanette did her PhD work at Ohio State, and uh, this is a reference to that work. Now, uh, Jeanette and I swapped visits to our campuses. She went out to Portland State, and she, I believe she's still there. Never met Kathy Hyde, but her work has this very, very important phrase in it. And Phoebe uh, and I swapped. Uh, Phoebe never came to Rose, but I went out to uh, Trinity, uh, met Phoebe. She's retired, and I've lost track of her. Now, all three of them took a look at uh, Maple 
to see its effect on uh, a classroom. And this phrase, resequencing skills and concepts, summarizes the, uh, the impact, they will, stressing the fact that the technology could be used to reverse the typical sequence that happens in, in a classroom, drill a student in skills, and then promise them that when they've mastered all of these skills, we'll let them do something useful with these skills, like learn a concept. And what they were saying here with this phrase, resequence, put the concepts first and worry about the skills later. And while this was happening, and somebody else doing something similar. I ran across a Wolfgang Christian at a conference, uh, actually several conferences. Uh, Wolfgang created Fizzlets, which are physics apps. And here's the home page for his work. And what Wolfgang had to do to write these physics applets in Java was to write some Java code that would support the mathematics he needed to build these fizzlets. And he made it very clear, and he was quite clear in his own mind too, that the issue about the technology wasn't the technology, it was what you did with it. It was the applet you made and how the applet served the needs of the student. And you can see here that uh, this work over the years ended up as a couple of books in which the physics course is based on the access to these applets. So it wasn't just in math that people were thinking about these uses of technology. And at the same time, you have the work of Jerry Ewell at the uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Urbana-Champaign is 90 miles from Terre Haute, Indiana, where Rose Holman was. You can get there in 90 minutes by car. And in a summer Saturday morning in 1988, Jerry invited a couple of uh, us from Rose Holman to come out and see what he was doing with Calculus and Mathematica, and we did that. And he was very gracious hosted us and made very clear that the issue of the technology wasn't the technology, but it was what it could be used for with respect to revising the curriculum. Look up Jerry Ewell on the internet. You'll find lots of things that he's written and said. Unfortunately, he's passed away in, I think, 2010. There was this article I dug up off the internet by Doug Shore about Jerry Ewell. Apparently Jerry Ewell had to give a talk, and, he, and the talk was him saying, he had a lot of interesting things to say, but he found that other people had said them better, so he just started quoting these other people, and that was his talk. And I just pull out one of those from uh, that talk, and you'll see this backwards. Teach math backwards. Teach the concepts first. He says images and patterns first, and all of the rest of the stuff later. So that's the point that I would like to make about the use of technology. It's got to change the curriculum. It can't just be pasted onto a course. It has to be used to change the curriculum, to infuse the curriculum with new insights using the tools as learning devices. I'd like to give you an example of that. Non-trivial example. It's done in Maple. Project a vector onto a subspace. And subspace would be two-dimensional, so uh, it would be a plane. I'm going to project a vector onto the plane. Now, student in linear algebra who's at this point in the course will have already seen how to do this in a multivariate calculus course because they have learned to project onto a normal vector, the vector normal to the plane given two vectors 
in R3, they know how to find the normal to the plane defined by those two vectors. Well, in linear algebra, you would do things like find a projection matrix, and then this one down here, this technique down here, is the one that I think gives students the most trouble because they can't visualize what it is that they're doing, and that is to minimize the, the distance between the tip of the vector C, which is being projected, and an arbitrary vector in the plane. So let's take a look at how this would go in Maple. So I've done a lot of this work ahead of time to make the presentation run more smoothly. I've got to define the three vectors, C, A, and B. Uh, what I used was this matrix template, right? Now you can dynamically size the template, insert the template, fill in the numbers, and then right click. Okay, so I'm in a Windows computer. Uh, I've got a two button mouse, so the secondary menu is what you want. You right click in Maple Tailors this pop-up menu to what you clicked on. And you can do all of these things simply by selecting from this menu. And I used assign to a name and assign the name C. This avoids the syntax of colon equal, etc. And I did that for vectors A and B. Now this is the uh, technique uh, right here that would get a direct answer right off the bat. What is the answer to this question? It's a task template, and that's one of Maple's built-in tools. And here's a collection of tools here in Maple. There are some assistants, there are some tutors, and this is a task template. So it's in the third category. It's inserted into the workspace. The vector C is to be projected. A and B are the basis for the plane upon which we're projecting. This is the projection, and this is the orthogonal complement. Now, you have them color-coded here because if you look at this image, you'll see a bit of the plane. The two blue vectors span the plane, and that's why I put blue over here, A and B. The, gr uh, the black vector is C that's going to be projected. Green is the projection, and red is the orthogonal component. Right, so this is the picture that you spend 15 minutes trying to draw on the board and never get right, uh, and you get it for free with this tool simply by inserting the information and pressing the appropriate buttons. So there's the answer. There's the picture. There's the concept. This is what it is that you're trying to, to accomplish. This is what the student in uh, the multivariate calculus course would do. It would take the cross product of A and B and get to normal. Oh, how did I get that cross product symbol? Well, here I have a cross product operator. It's in the favorites palette, which is a compilation of things that I find useful and make use of. Here is a cross product symbol. You add it to the favorites palette by clicking add to favorites palette. Okay, so that's where I got the cross product. So I, I type n equals a cross b. And I right click on that and I select assign name. So Maple does the calculation and assigns it to the name N, and I typed N uh, so you can see what the outcome was. Then the projection, and multivariate calculus, count three, C dot N over N dot N, N is the projection of C on, the vector projection of C on N. And I hit the enter key, and there's the component along the normal, right? There's the component along the normal, they agree. Okay, and then the component orthogonal to that, which would be the component in the plane, is obtained by dif uh, differencing c minus. And you notice there's an equation label here one. You can reference this vector by that equation label. And if you want to see the actual vector, right click and change label to label reference, and you can see it's c minus this is that. Okay, so that's the uh, the method that the student would already have seen, and it really 
is useful at that point to uh, show the student uh, the connection between what they already know and what they're learning. Linear algebra technique is the form of projection matrix. This is the recipe for a projection matrix. You have a matrix M whose columns span the subspace. Now, since you're going to uh, form this product, that T is the transpose, you can form this product, you have to get the inverse. You want to make sure that this matrix is invertible. And it will be because A and B are independent, which we discovered when we took the cross product and got a non-zero vector. So those two vectors, A and B, are independent. The matrix M, whose columns are A and B, uh, would have full rank. So let's form M. Type A comma B, hit the enter key, right click on that, and there is a conversion to augmented matrix. So that's how we got the augmented matrix. And then we right clicked on that, and it says assigned to a name, and that's how we assigned it the name M. Now, this recipe converts in maple, the period is a non-commutative multiplication, percent T for transpose. So again, right click and assign name. So the computation is carried out, assigned to P, and I type P equals, so that you can see that there is really a matrix form. And the projection is then P applied to C, so P dot C, non-commutative multiplier. And uh, the projection, does that look familiar? Let me find it over here. Uh, you have to have a good memory to see that. And then by subtraction, you get the uh, other component. And finally, take a look at what's really the most challenging part of this uh, approach. Figuring out what it is that you're trying to do when you're minimizing the error. Well, read the, go back and read the question. It says here, a multiple a linear combination of A and B uh, forms a generic vector in the plane. And that's what we're using uh, for a generic vector. This is an image of the plane, a piece of the plane spanned by A and B. The black vector is C. The red vector is the normal. Okay. The vector from the tip of this arbitrary vector in the plane to C. This is the vector whose length we want to minimize. Now here is a piece of the AB plane. Okay. As I select points, Maple would wake up and pay. There he is. Maple is now awake. As I select pairs of AB uh, tuples in this AB plane, that information is transferred over to this graph where that generic vector AA plus BB uh, responds. And you can see this number here is the length of that gold vector. Okay, so I'm computing the length of that gold vector. And look at the number. I'm trying to get it. It's small. It's five something. And I think I get it down. Oh, I think I get it down to four something if I'm lucky here. There, it's four something. It's about as small as you're going to get it. And you can see that the, the green vector is now the projection of this black vector goal vector is parallel to the normal. That's what you're trying to do. That's what this calculation is all about. And that's what should come first. That's what I mean about putting the concept before you bury the student in computation. And here's the computation. We need to form the generic vector AA plus BB. There's that vector. The vector whose length you want to minimize is C minus that. So there's C minus that. And then I right click and I find Euclidean norm. 
And having obtained that Euclidean norm, I noticed that Maple didn't do as much simplifying as I would have liked, absolute values in there, because Maple thinks that maybe A and B could be complex numbers, in which case you've got to be a little bit more careful. So we right-click and we pick Simplify Assuming Real, and you see that Maple cleans that up. And then I gave that a name, I assigned it to the name F. And it, F is the scalar quantity I want to minimize. Now, how do you minimize? Well, you take partial derivatives and set them equal to zero. Well, how did I get the partial derivative symbols? Well, I used them right here from this expression palette. Partial with respect to A equals zero. Partial with respect to B equals zero. Hit the Enter key. These are the two equations I have to solve. How do I solve them? Right click. There's solve. And you have a variety of ways that you can solve things. And I picked the simplest one, solve. And here is the solution. When A is equal to this and B is equal to that, uh, you will have minimized F. And if you look carefully, you will see here A is roughly minus 1 and B is roughly a half. And if you go back to this picture over here, you'll see that A is roughly minus 1 and B is roughly a half. Okay, now how do I transfer this information to this vector? Well, I use this template right here in the expression palette. Now that template stands for the evaluate command. So th uh, 2 stands for the vector AA plus BB, and if you want to see that, rather than the label, right click, change the label to a label reference. And 4 is this information right here, and if you want to see what that information is, right click and change label to label reference, in other words, that which the label is referencing. And now you see the mathematical statement that says if you take this vector and make these substitutions for A and B, you're going to get this vector. And that 5 over 26 should ring a bell. And if you do the same thing down here for the component orthogonal to the plane, uh, you can similarly visualize or see uh, what that computation is. So I made a point. The point that I, I hope I made is you don't want to just take technology and paste it on a course. You want to take the technology and use it intelligently to change the way the course proceeds, to enlighten the student, fuse the, the course with insights that are not normally possible. For this to work, you can't spend time teaching the tool. The tool has to be simple to use. I hope that you could draw that conclusion from the work I did in this Maple worksheet here, that the tool is easy to use. This Maple paradigm of point and click, clickable calculus, syntax-free computing, take, flattens the learning curve, meaning that you don't have to spend time teaching the tool. You can spend your time teaching the subject matter with an emphasis on concept before you worry about skill development. And if there are any questions at this point, I'll be happy to field them. Hi, my name is Jack Weiner. I'm a professor emeritus of mathematics at the University of Guelph. I am honored to be part of MapleSoft's first virtual user conference. I say first because I hope it will become an annual event. Um, I'd like them to consider renaming it instead of a virtual user conference. Let's call it a virtuous user conference. Uh, I have been asked to talk about how I have used technologies in and beyond my classroom to make, in particular, uh, the, the first-year calculus sequence a better experience for my students, um, and the technologies I've used beyond the tr traditional calculators and stuff. Uh, I use Maple extensively in the classroom, and I use Maple TA testing and assessment beyond the classroom. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit of background. In 2005, um, I got an email from 
a very happy father uh, who said that my daughter has a copy of your book, a book I wrote called The Math Survival Kit, Mathematics Survival Kit, and he said that she's not a big math fan, but she loves your book, thinks it's the most friendly um, and, and, and entertaining and useful math book she's ever read. And that was gratifying. And then he said, I'm the president and CEO of MapleSoft, and we would like to do a Maple version of your book. And uh, so as soon as I picked myself up the floor, we continued our conversation. And the short story is we did do a Maple version of the book, which I'm very proud of. It's a wonderful interactive learning tool. Um, I say that because I really believe that, not because it's my book. And uh, also we had such a good partnership that um, – Jim and the company said, we would like you to see what possibilities, what are the possibilities if you had no limits of incorporating technology like Maple, like TA, in and beyond your classroom to make your students' learning experience a better experience. So my students, for the next several years, were given Maple for free. The University of Guelph was given access to Maple TA for free, and I was given the time I needed um, in the spring semester and at other times of the year, working 24 hours a day, uh, to create the resources and try them out in class to try and improve the classroom experience. Now, normally I would take an hour to talk about all this stuff, but I don't have an hour. I've only got about 17 or 18 minutes left. So I'm going to give you a taste, just a taste, of some of the things that we've done in the classroom, which I think have made the class so much more effective and fun for my students. And uh, I'd like to give you a quick example out of the classroom of how we've used TA to both enforce uh, homework and reinforce the learning. And maybe I'll show you a little bit of Math Survival Kit too. But we don't have a lot of time, so let me get right into it by getting out of our slideshow and into my Maple Demo Program. So. Uh, this is all about honors calculus at the University of Guelph, starting in winter 2007 to the present. Um, but the last year I officially taught this course was two years ago, and the students gave me a thank you at the end, which I treasure to this day. Um, just notes and and pictures and well, one student um, even said uh, gave me this little thing: alcohol and calculus don't mix, never drink and derive. And they created this nice little maple graph. And there you have it. And that's a pretty good, you know, if I did an actual photograph of myself, that would be pretty close to what you're seeing on the screen. That's what I look like. Anyway, what really pleased me about that was that it was, wasn't just about using Maple in the classroom to make their learning experience better. I also wanted them to start using this technology for their own explorations. And this is an example that the students were doing exactly that. So, as I said, very, qu very quickly, little taste of what we've done. So first of all, the students have a course manual, and it contains all the notes in the course, 60% complete. So they're interactive notes. They're notes that we fill out in class so that they're not spending all their time just transcribing and not listening to anything. They're actually doing the work with me, and they don't have to copy out the stuff. I don't need them to copy out, but it needs to be there to structure the notes. So interactive classes. And this is what a page from the lab manual would look like. And here's one on one-sided limits. But the beauty of what we've done with these notes is that the students also have the notes electronically, and the notes have all the Maple commands built in. So here's the function f of x, and standard first-year example with limits from one side and the other. But I'm going to enter the function, and now I'll get the students to tell me what the limit is x is goes to minus 1 from the left coming in this side, and they'll tell me the limit is 3, but then we'll ask Maple for the answer, and Maple verifies it. Um, so my point is that we, first of all, do this by hand. We got it. We still have to do the mathematics. We have to learn how the mathematics work. But we can use Maple to reinforce it, and I can change the questions on the go so that the classes are dynamically interactive. Now, I would usually say a lot more about that, but the short story is all the classes are set up this way, 60 to 70 cents complete. We fill in and do the math together, but almost every example throughout the notes throughout the entire course is also set up as a maple executable command so we can see what maple says about it and we can explore with maple we can dynamically change the question and say what if what if and we do that all the time connect the algebra and the picture 
So here's an example from another class where I want them to solve the absolute value of 7x equals x minus 4. Now, I filled in the details that we would have done in class, and I've come up with the answer. And the answer happens to be that there's no solution. You have two cases. You either have case 1 where x is greater than 0 or case 2 where x is less than 0, and it turns out there's no solution in either case. But what we always try to do in class is to connect the algebra with the geometry because every teacher out there knows that if you understand the algebra, that's a level of understanding. The geometry, that's another level. If you understand both together, it's so much more than the sum of the understandings, the sum of the separate parts. So let's see what's really going on. Enter, 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 enter. What's really going on is that I only get to use this graph when x is greater than 0. And this graph does intersect the other one, but it intersects it in a place where x isn't allowed to be. And this graph does intersect the other one, but in a place where x isn't allowed to be. So the algebra really brings to life, the geometry really brings to life this algebraic exercise that said, hey, these don't have an intersection, even though we, and, and here's why. We get an answer of minus two-thirds, but we have to exclude it because we have x greater than zero. Well, there's the x greater than zero, and there's the x equal to minus two-thirds, and that's why we excluded it. And it just, the kids see it so much better. They understand it so much better. I understand it so much better. Then we would also solve this problem by squaring both sides, and you, most of you know that if you square both sides, then you have to check the answers because you can introduce roots that weren't there to begin with. Well, we do that. We square, we find the answers, same answers as above. We check both sides, and neither answer worked. But to really see what's going on, we do the plot. And what happened with the plot is that the answer down here, there was a certain value, and there was a negative value and a positive value that had the same magnitude. And when you squared that magnitude, now you've got an intersection point. That's why we found the intersection point. I'm gesturing with my hands. You can't see me. Um, that's why we found the intersection point using this. So once again, what I'm getting at here is that, you know, in the first Example, the class are interactive. In the second example, we always connect the algebra with the picture. And I'm talking too much, so we're going on to the third one, making a, different ex a difficult example come to life. This is really powerful. I don't know how many people still teach epsilon delta limits out there, but um, this is the best demonstration, the best demonstration of limits I've ever, epsilon delta limits I've ever seen. It was done by a grad student of mine who's now a, a terrific high school teacher. Um, what you're going to see here is a demonstration about how here we have the function y equals x squared, and there's not much curvature showing because it's such a limited portion of the curve. And I want x to approach 2, so the limit is 4. And now I'm saying I want the epsilon value to be 0.5. So I want the y value to be between 4.5 and 3.5. And look what this beautiful demo does. Most kids, when they solve epsilon delta questions in the first year, they simply say, I don't have a clue what's going on. I'm just going to solve the problem because I know how to do it mechanically, but I don't really have a clue why this works. Well, this substantially increased the number of students who had a clue why it worked. You see what's going on there? There's the delta value. That There are the limits of the x values that will keep the y values between 4.5 and 3.5. And if I change this 0.5 to 1.5, so that now what I want is the, x, the y values to be between 4 and 5.5 and 1.5, watch what happens with the delta. Run the animation. And this time, I get to explain to students that say that there's no symmetry for the delta. It's bigger on one side than the other side. Here, we can't quite reach the limit we're allowed to reach in the picture because we've already reached the limit on this side. Once again, this demonstration really brought up side of the delta to life in a way never before. Couldn't do this without the technology, without Maple. Learning by intimidation. I love this. You and I as teachers both know that sine x to the fifth minus three, in order to make that an easy integral, you need this x to the fourth outside. Not x cubed, not x to the sixth, it had to be x to the fourth, and there's a reason for that. Well, you keep trying to talk to the kids about the chain rule in reverse and the reason that works. We do this by hand. I think I get them to understand, and I get them to do lots of questions like that, and they can see the answer is easy. But here is a way I use maple that is very non-standard, and boy, did this have a wonderful effect. You can hear my smile. I would say, look, 
This had to be X to the fourth. Watch what happens if I put an X to the fifth there. Are you ready for this? And the kids are all on the edge of the seats. Yes, 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 yes. And I press the button and watch what happens. And then they go, ah, ah. That's just terrifying. That, more than my saying, do you understand the chain rule reverse? By seeing the horror story down here, and excuse me if that's an insult to the mathematical functions necessary to complete this integral, um, really made teaching the chain rule in reverse more effective. Uh, effective use of animation and a bonus bit of fun. We have to do the cycloid with parallel parametric equations. Well, there's my cycloid. I've got a few pictures of it. You know what the cycloid is. You put a nail in a bicycle wheel and you roll the bicycle wheel along and you're looking for the curve uh, traced out by the nail. So here and here and here. Well, got this nice little animation plot. And let's roll that plot. So I actually bring a bicycle wheel into the classroom and roll. Actually, no, I don't. I bring a hula hoop into the classroom. And I usually have some student demonstrate how to use a hula hoop. I show them my ability with a hula hoop, and it's really pitiful. But usually there's at least one student in the class who can do it really well. But here is a beautiful animation of the cycloid. So I'll just run that. And you can see that tangent line I've got showing you the point, the curve that looks like somebody rowing a boat. But having done that, one year, one year I made a mistake, not a mistake, I just accidentally put a 2 on that S and I entered it. And think about the millions and millions of calculations that are going on, and you couldn't do this even 15 years ago, but now it's ready to go. And look what happens by putting just that S squared instead of S. Ooh. And, of course, having done it in the one year by inadvertently putting the square on the S, now I do it all the time, and the students... This is wonderful. The students want to get out of the class in a hurry, not because they're bored. They can't wait to go and show their artsy friends what they did in math class. I'm not kidding. Okay, so um, bringing negative radius to life. This is another thing that wonderful grad student, now teacher, did for me. This is polar animation. One of the things students found really hard in polar coordinates was the idea of plotting negative radius, that you have to plot it as if it's positive and then reflect through the origin. Well, look what Gord did. So we are going to plot 3 sine 2 theta. It's a four-leaf rose. And there he's plotting directly, but now you have negative radius. And you see what he did? He plotted it as if it was positive and reflected it down. And then in the fourth, qu fourth quadrant, he does the same thing. And he's got lots of examples like this. Um, and when I do that, and I run it more slowly for the students, I lose the anxiety that I usually get from students about what negative radius is all about. Um, bringing approximation to life. Maple has so much built in that makes things come to life. So, for example, here's the Taylor approximation for e to the x. I've asked for the first few polynomials, 1, 1 plus x, and so on. But again, what I said earlier about the geometry combined with the algebra, there's the picture. And you can see there's the 1, and there's the 1 plus x, and the 1 plus x plus a half x squared. And the more terms you have, the closer and the longer it stays um, it, the, to the actual curve. And it just made it, you know, brings it to life in a way that you don't have, you couldn't do easily in the days when I took calculus a billion years ago. 3D. Well, normally when I did calculus, when I was a university student in first and second year, we had to do 3D pl or, uh, surfaces in three dimensions. We do traces. We try to find some way, but sine of x squared, well, here's one that I could never do. Plot x squared minus y squared. This is the one the sat with the saddle point which simultaneously has a max and min at the same place. And the fact that I can do this with maple and rotate it in real time, and by the way, 15 years ago, I couldn't rotate it in real time. You'd have to create 15 different slides and put them together. And now, because the processing is so much faster, and that, that surface comes to life for me and for my students so much better than it did when I had to take it. Sine of x squared plus y squared is this wonderful Mexican hat dance. Uh, I just, I love this picture. 
And then we can talk about what's going on. The fact that as X and Y get farther from the origin, you start getting these sine waves quicker and quicker and quicker, which is why it gets uh, squashed in as you head outward from the origin. Very, very nice. And then you can say, oh, look, you see that nice little basin in there? Turn it upside down, look at its underpants. You know, it's really kind of cute. Um, the mass survival kit. Now I think, okay, so all you've seen so far is the stuff that I've done with Maple inside the classroom. Outside the classroom, um, first I want to show you this thing, which I, my students have access to as well, the mass survival kit. Now, the mass survival kit, what I did with this was created a book where there were 200 topics all of which start at grade 8 and go up to first year university. And the idea of this book was that you're in grade 12 and you're stuck because you can't remember how to complete the square from grade 11. And you don't want to go through a whole chapter, a whole book. All you want is a very quick one-page review of how to do that. And that's what the My Survival Kit gives you. It gives you one page, very friendly, very easy to read. And the whole idea is that if you, all you need is that, that one thing, you've done it before, and you're really up on the material, you don't need a whole chapter. You just need the one page. So that's what I would do. And I want to show you one page from the My Survival Kit that I am so proud of. It's the one in the basic Craig trig graphs. So the one page would just say, here they are. Here's the basic trig graphs, and they've got them listed. And then there would be one for you. It would be something you could explore where you would click for the graphs, and then I set it up so you choose. So this one we know is the tan, and this one from the drop-down box happens to be the um, secant, and you would do that for all six, and at the end, you would say, click to check your answer, and it would say, because we would get all six right, we're really smart, good for us. Or we could always click for the answer, and it would give us a nice display. But that's the way the print book worked. When it came to Maple, how are we going to use Maple to make this book so much more effective? And what we came up with was this concept called More to Explore. And now, using um, component boxes and using algorithmic questions, here's what we did. And this is the one, I'm, I'm just so proud of this. Um, click for a question. So there's an A value of 3 quarters pi. Now remember, all I really wanted to reinforce this section was what the basic trig graphs looked like. But... I decided, and because I have the power of maple behind me, let's do more than that. Let's not only make them choose a trig graph, but let's see if they could choose a transformation to that trig graph. So in this instruction, with A being 3 quarters, there's a red function. It's one of the trig functions. And there's a green function. We've done something to that trig function. We've either moved it to the left to the right, we've squeezed it, we've stretched it, we've moved it up, we've moved it down. Which one? So we look at this, and the A value is 3 quarters pi. Now, look at this. Everybody knows out there that that's the sine function, so let's call it the cos function. Let's get it wrong. Now, what have we done to that? We have 3 quarters pi. I think what we have done is we have moved it. Um, we've taken this point, and we've moved it this way. It's over here. So we have shifted it to the left. So the answer should be x plus a. Well, let's do this. Let's shift it to the, let's squeeze it instead. And watch what happens with the feedback. This is so great. Click to check your answer. Sorry, no. Check out the plots below. Now look what happens down below. It says below is the trig function. This is the one you chose. If it doesn't match the red graph, you got it wrong. I don't. We design this so that you don't get both answers. You only get the one answer. Let's not work on this until you get this one right. So now we'll say, oh, that's not cosine. That's the sine function. So we'll put sine. And now we'll say, okay, check my answer. Sorry, no. Below is the trig function you chose, and it does match. If it does match, then look at your transformation. You got the wrong transformation. You better choose that again. So I'm going to choose the transformation. This time I am going to shift it to the left, and I'm going to say, oh, good for me. And then I'm going to go back up here and click for another question. And everybody out there, math teachers worldwide, I'm telling you, kids who don't know the trig, basic trig graphs and they don't know these basic transformations, 10 minutes. Ten minutes with this page, and they are an expert in both. I am so proud of this. Anyway, I love the reinforcement that says, don't just say wrong. Take the wrong answer and get them to learn from that wrong answer. All right, so I'm going to finish off with one more thing. Maple TA 
And Maple TA to me is enforced homework. What have we done for centuries? You know, go to the book, do these questions. You go to the book and you do the questions on the back. And one thing, one of the things is that you go to the back and all you're doing is you're checking your answer. You're not checking whether the people have had good mathematical form, good thinking processes. Secondly, suppose the answer in the back, and this is <laughs> so common with calculus and, and other more advanced subjects, the answer doesn't look like your answer, but it still could be correct. Well, Maple TA gets us all around that. Also, and this could be seen as a negative, to do Maple TA is an awful lot of work first time through because instead of compromising, and it is a compromise, by using a textbook and saying, I'll take the best homework I can find that this person has written that conforms to what my learning objectives for my students are, that's a compromise. With TA, no compromise. You create your own questions. And then, once you've done that work the first year, well then, it's easy to maintain, tweak, make better and better year by year. Also, on the Maple Application Center, the TA Application Center, you don't really have to do things from scratch because people have generously put the work they up there so that you have all this choice. And when you take somebody's question, there's no compromise. If you take somebody's question and it's not quite what you want, but it's close, then you can see the coding and tweak it so it becomes exactly what you want. So I'm a real believer in TA because it lets me do the kind of homework for my students that I want them to do. So now let's take a look at a Maple TA sample test. And again, I'm not going to take you through all the questions. I just want I just want you to see the possibilities. And and uh, if you, so, for example, in the first one, solve the absolute value inequality. Now I'm not interested. I don't want these kids to guess at an answer or to look at a multiple choice selection and maybe look for a pattern. Uh, I really want to know that they've done the work and they've understood the process. So one of the things I love about TA is that the students have to work out the, I can force them to work out the answer and enter it in. By the way, there is never any ambiguity about how to enter the answer because if there were, then I'd build in the instructions to the question. So for example, it says give your answer using interval notation, enter infinity for, inf for the infinity sign, and u for union, and so on, and and then I actually give an example. So the point is, I never have students saying I entered it correctly, and uh, but there was a little syntax error, or, or it's not the way Maple expected it. They always have the prototype there. And by the way, something I have to tell you about TA. I have had thousands of students over the last seven years as I've been using this, and in all that time, I have probably had 300 students complain to me that, I had the right answer, and Maple TA marked me wrong. The score at this time is Maple TA 299 students won. Maple TA always marks it correctly. And the one aberration was not something bizarre with the student where the student didn't realize that they missed a bracket or something like that. It was an answer, a very simple answer, like XY, and the student put in XY. And all I can think of and I think it's reasonable because of things going on at the time, there was an electronic glitch and there was a, a nanosecond of electronic shutdown and the correction didn't come through. But it had nothing to do with, the, with an inability of TA to implement its prime directive. And I'll tell you what TA's prime directive is. You take the correct answer and you subtract the student's answer, and you simplify that. And no matter how the student has written it, as long as the syntax is correct, then the difference between the two, algebraic or arithmetic, is going to be zero. And that means the student gets the mark. Okay, next question. Um, I, the next question, I'm just demoing this, that you can do multiple choice if you want. So here's what the graph of y equals 10x, and they have to choose the right one. Next question. I love that with TA, I can force them to tell me in parts. I can do multiple things. So for this question, I want them to tell me about the domain of the function and the range of the function. And then mixing it up, um, I asked about an asymptote for that function. It can do limit questions, and you can build hints into it. Um, here's an interesting question. Click beside each true statement. Well, I'm going to do this and this and this, and this, and this. This is a multiple selection, not multiple choice, multiple selection. And watch the how did I do. 
So there's the feedback. So I've set it up so that on the practice, the kids can check out their answer on the go. With homework tests, they can't do that. But notice that I got this correct. All five answers were correct. Got to tell you, that drives students crazy. They think this can't be. There's got to be at least one wrong answer. Uh, so uh, I did that as a psychological twist. Um, okay, next question. Uh, I'm going to skip that one and that one. And once again, here I'm doing a, um, a an approximation question. And you notice that here I'm not even asking for the approximation. What I want to know is if they know how to set up the differential process. So they tell me that the function is supposed to be x to the one third, and the a value is 64, and the dx is minus 0.1. And you know what's the point of asking them for the right answer if they don't know that that's the process? And when it comes to a midterm, and by the way, the midterms they have to do the full solution, that's the kind of thing I'm going to ask for as well as the answer. Ah, this is a melting snowman. The spherical head of a snow person is melting under the hot sun at a certain rate. So uh, anyway, standard related rate question. But you know, I wrote this question at 3 o'clock in the morning and I googled melting snow person and found that picture and I'm probably in danger of uh, using somebody. I, I, I'm probably... Um, violated somebody's copyright but you know when the kids are doing this test they come across that it makes every one of them smile um i'm going to go to the next question and um i love this question when we're doing graph sketching and we want them to do the full analysis, they have to do intercepts and where it's increasing, where it's decreasing, where it's concave up and concave down, but I want them to practice those component parts first. So I've set this question up simply to say, show me that you know how to take a derivative and analyze from the derivative where the function is increasing or decreasing. So you look at the way I've set this up. I've got a couple of factors on top and a factor on the bottom. I've set up the factor on the bottom with an exponent of two-thirds, and if you're experienced enough in calculus, you know that that's going to lead not to an asymptote, but to a, um, to a, uh, a cusp point. And I want them to tell me about uh, the intervals where it's increasing, so where the derivative is positive. Now, you, if you're, if you're experienced teaching calculus, know that it's not easy to come up with nice functions whose derivatives factor that nicely. But I didn't have to worry about this here. I set up algorithmically the derivatives so that it's x plus 4, x plus 3, x minus 7. Um, these things change every time, but it's always of this form and it's a good example forcing the students to use number nine analysis to determine where the function is increasing and decreasing. They have to answer an answer. I'm going to put S, which is wrong, but look what happens with how did I do. Okay, in the how did I do, you see not only the correct answer, so it tells me what the answer is supposed to be, but look at the graph. Now, what I did to get that graph was simply to say to Maple in the solutions, Maple, take this derivative function, which we've created algorithmically, integrate it, and plot it for me. It would be so much harder to take a function, find functions which, when di differentiated, give me that nice derivative that the students can work with. I didn't have to do that. I created the derivative that emphasized the teaching objective, and then I had Maple integrate it and give me the curve. And the beauty of that curve is they can see minus infinity to minus 4, there's the increasing portion. 7 to infinity, there's the increasing portion. And it goes back to what I said 20 minutes ago. The algebra and the geometry reinforce one another. I am just so proud of that. I'm so proud, and I'm so happy that I can do that, that I can do that and help the students master uh, the material so much better. And then we have the standard stuff with um, integration and area problems where, once again, I don't want them just to do the estimate. I want them to see every time exactly what they do, they're doing. So there we have three rectangles, and we're using... Um, left end points to get the area, and we're doing the approximation. And again, I'm asking them for everything down below. Give me the interval, give me the xi, the special x value, work it out, do the approximation. Uh, I do it for three, and I do it for, well, there's another three, um, 
and sometimes uh, it, it's algorithmic. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's four, but if they can do the three and the four, then they certainly master the process. So you can see the capability and what's available with TA. And there's so much more to talk about with respect to TA, but time's running low, and I'm getting um, signals from the people running this conference saying it's time to wrap. So here's what we have for you. If you go to the Maple Application Center here, is a link, and if you go to that, you'll be able to download a package that includes all the interactive notes that I talked about earlier, the entire TA module that gives uh, a complete set of homework for the entire course, both the first calculus course and the second course. It has sample midterms and finals, and it's been used by a lot of people, and once again, it's useful to begin with, and it's not carved in stone. The coding is all there. And my coding, you know, I'm not a brilliant coder, but I'm pretty transparent, so you could easily get into the coding and say, you know, that's pretty good, but here's what I'd really rather do, tweak it so it becomes uniquely your, your own. And then you share your stuff with, with Maple. So there you have it. That's the kind of stuff that I do in class and outside of the class, and it really has made, um, made the experience better for the students better for me, and I've done it with classes of 12, and I've done it with classes of 600, and it works with the small classes and the big classes. So uh, I'm going, ready to take your questions, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And by the way, after the questions, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you by email. Um, if you do use some of these resources and you have questions, um, please contact me. Happy to talk about it. That concludes this session. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to visit the communication lounge to ask your questions. I'd like to remind you that a recorded version of today's presentations will be archived and you'll be notified when it's available.